Hello, and welcome to Seeing in the Dark. I'm your host, Jennifer Monk. And on today's show, we will be looking at a few different topics about blindness and visual impairment. We'll be looking into the effects of blindness. We'll interact with two guests who, has, who, has, who are blind themselves and also hear from someone who is advocating for the blind as a social worker. As we get this show underway, here in the studio with me today is Dr. Randall Melchart. Dr. Randall Melchart, optometrist at Melchart Eye Care in Brookville, Wisconsin. Thank you for joining us, Dr. Melchart. My pleasure to be here. Can you tell us about how you got started in optometry? Well, I didn't have any great revelation. I had finished a year of college and didn't know what I should really do with my life, and my older brother recommended optometry. He said, this would be a good job for you, so I sent away for information and just kept pursuing it until I became an optometrist. That was honestly very inform informal. So, what kind of what kind of damage what kind of damage is common for eye care? What kind of damage is common to an eye? Well, many things that we deal with are injuries to the eyeball itself. When people are careless with working with different tools or if they're working on the job without safety glasses, often the front of the eye becomes injured. I brought a model of the eye along to illustrate that a little bit. The very front of the eye is called the cornea and that's where people lay a contact lens and it's also a very, very sensitive area even a single eyelash can really hurt when it's laying on the front of the eye or scratching the cornea. So we try to encourage people and educate people to wear protective eyewear. If they are doing any kind of work where there might be moving objects like sawdust or wood chips or metal chips, they should always be wearing protective eye care, eyewear to protect their eyes from those kinds of injuries. Okay. What are glasses? What are glass eyes? Glass eyes are used when someone has had a very unfortunate condition of actually losing their eye. And they are little tiny things. I have a model one here that is used to give the appearance of having a natural, normal eye, but there's no vision there. It's just a replacement or a prosthesis, an artificial eye that is used to make it look to an observer looking at the patient from the front, look just like their other eye. And they come in all different colors. The veins are portrayed by using little thin, very thin little fibers of red yarn. And then the color of the eye, this one is a brown one. Can I see that? Certainly. This one is a light blue eye. And when glass eyes are ordered, a very clear, crisp, magnified picture of the other eye is made so that the glass eye, the fellow eye, or the other eye, can be made to just look like the remaining eye, so that both eyes look very, very similar. So we try to get pictures of it to when we order, have somebody else order a glass eye. We don't do that in our office, but we do help with people who need that and when people need them cleaned and polished, we do that work in our office for people that have already been fitted with a glass eye. Okay. Um, what kind of schooling did you have to take? Optometry school is a four-year course after college. So during college, one needs to get all the basics, the math, the science, anatomy, physiology. And then if one is accepted into optometry school, it's a four-year course in order to complete the instruction. So what are a few eye conditions that can cause blindness and visual impairment? Well, as we mentioned, injury to the eye. If someone gets poked in the eye badly with any kind of object, stick or whatever, that can cause the eye to lose its entire ability. There are a lot of diseases that can happen in the back of the eye. The retina is the inside lining of the inside back surface of the eye, and that 
there's conditions called retinitis pigmentosa where there's pigment that's disrupted in the retina. Other conditions, macular degeneration that causes damage to the back of the eye. And those conditions, some of them will cause partial blindness and some can cause, like with a retinal detachment, can cause total blindness in the eye, meaning like no light perception even. Oh, wow. That's kind of scary. That is, <laughs> yes. We try to, diseases are unfortunate, but injuries, we just feel really badly when somebody's injured their eye because they didn't have safety glasses on, safety goggles. People generally in school, I think, in chemistry class are trained that they should always have safety goggles on anytime they're working with something like that. And we hope as they become an adult and go into the workplace, they will also wear safety eye protection, safety glasses, safety goggles to protect their eyes from any risks that might be happening in the workplace. So you talked about um, the eye protection and what people need to do. Um, what are some, what are, what kind of problems are common in what you see in new, when you meet new patients? Well, most people thankfully have healthy eyes. P people may need glasses if they're nearsighted, if they're farsighted, if they have astigmatism or some combination of that. And those are relatively easy cases to be fixed. And those, usually a pair of glasses or contacts can be done to do that quite easily. The problems come when people have diseases that affect the different parts of the eye that damage the eye or injuries to the eye. And that makes it more challenging, more difficult, and sometimes the outcome is not so good if people have had a terrible disease or injury to their eye. Okay. Well, I, well, I think that's all the time we have right now, but that was honestly very informative information, uh, Dr. Melchart, um, and these are some things, and these things seem minuscule um, to us, but it might cause problems later for other people if they don't take care of themselves. I've, I know I've learned a few things, and I'd like to thank you again for joining us and helping us uh, bring out awareness. It's been my pleasure to be here. Thank you. As we look at these various problems and other things that can cause blindness and visual impairment, what would you do if your sight has if your sight was suddenly taken from you and you needed to and you needed to know how to proceed to get back into the into the normal world? Well, let's look well, let's see into the very world of someone who hasn't let their blindness stop them from doing what she's been doing as a social worker. Erica Wise from Vision Forward in Milwaukee gives us a glimpse into the role she and the nonprofit nonprofit organization provides to everyone who steps through their through their doors. Erica has been the social link for many clients that Vision Forward serves. Well, I've been here a long time. I started 30 years ago. And actually my first job was with the Center for Blind and Visually Impaired Children, and I did that job for a good 25 years. But a few years back, that center merged with what was called the Badger Association, and we all moved to this building and became Vision Forward. So uh, now I've been with the adult wing here at Vision Forward for the last five years. So I have a, my degree in social work, my first jobs in social work were not in the vision impairment field, but I think that that was something I always was attracted to. You know, with my own blindness, I could relate to what people were going through a lot. I felt like I learned a lot about how people negotiate in the world with a, a limited vision. There's something that I'm really finding very gratifying in working directly with the visually impaired person, that um, I feel like I can share my experiences, my expertise even more with people who are going through similar situations or living the situation. Just like now, I'm doing a lot of groups for visually impaired people, and I find it's one of the most powerful 
resources that I have in working with the clients that we have here because people learn and listen to each other, I think, in a way that's different than listening to uh, people who have normal vision, who haven't had the well, living with it kind of experience. And Erica is much more open to helping those who need it. And so in this job, it's actually, I think, an asset to have my blindness. You know, I don't even know that many social workers who work in the blindness field. They're, they aren't that common. But I would think if someone doesn't have a vision impairment, they can still work well with, with blind and visually impaired people. Um, they would bring their own assets to the job. Vision Forward offers many services to assist others when needed. You know, Vision Forward has some kind of service for every visually impaired person. We don't only work with uh, people who are blind. So that a lot of people come here to get help enhancing the vision that they have when their glasses are not enough for them to see normally. And just getting some simple tools or some more complicated or um, sophisticated tools can make a big difference in what they're able to do, what they can do for work or fun or raising a family or taking care of their household. It makes, can make a real difference in how they continue on. Uh, we have technology training here so that people don't just get a computer but can learn how to use it either with very enlarged text so that they're able to see what's on the screen or with speech, like the computer that I use, where the computer uh, actually verbalizes back to you what you've put into it, or I can listen to email or internet. We teach people how to do those things here. And that is so important for people to get connected with other people these days. You know, if it's email or Facebook or internet, or it, it, those things are, are part of people's life so much that as a visually impaired person, you need to have access to that too. We have training here in activities of daily living. Sometimes people who lose vision feel lost about how to take care of things in their own home. They don't feel confident in their cooking anymore. They don't feel safe. They aren't sure that they're cleaning as, as well as they used to, or how are they gonna do their laundry? So we have occupational therapists here who works with people to learn to do all those things with new approaches, new tools. Again, I think just really central for people feeling like they have control of their life. Our O&M or orientation and mobility specialist is a teacher who has been specially trained to help people who have limited vision to get around. Whether that be with our little, we have very little children who come here and have tiny canes and are learning how to get around in their home, in their classrooms, um, in their backyard, to adults that are learning how to get around their workplace, their community, cross streets safely, you know, without any vision. They can learn to do those things. We have a store here where people can buy adaptive equipment or get their uh, canes or talking watches. So we have things for people who have no vision. We have things for people who have low vision and just need things to be and either is larger or enhanced in some way. Needed. And then as far as working with adults, I think the last part that I would mention is our support systems. Either that people are in groups where they meet one another, and then sometimes people aren't comfortable in a group, so I will match them individually with someone else that they can talk to uh, by phone or get together uh, on a one-to-one -one basis and do that same kind of thing that we have happening in the group but do it on an individual basis. I think that that happens to some degree too in my interactions just in the community in general and I talk with people here who I'm working with, the, the blind people that I work with, that we are taking our lives and putting them into the community so that other people have people to relate to. They can hear about the abilities of, of blind and visually impaired people, but if they see us out there 
doing things, working, taking the bus, uh, going to the fitness center, going to the movies or a play, you know, that we do things like other people do them. It really helps to break down the stereotypes about blindness, the fear about who we are, the uncomfortableness of it, so that I, I'm hoping that when people see me and interact with me that it's accomplishing that and I hope that that's something that I help teach people here to do too. The small things that people do can really leave a mark on those they help. Now as we turn to our next segment we'll hear from two individuals who both experienced their blindness and their journey through it. Joining us is Zach Mann and Jenna Antarian. Antarian? Antriasian. Antriasian. Hello to you both and welcome to the show. Hello. Hello. So let's start this time off with Zach. Can you tell me a little bit, abor a little bit more about yourself? So I'm uh, 28 years old. I actually lost my sight. Um, starting at a very young age, starting in about five months. And I gradually lost the rest of it. Um, I finally lost the rest of it when I was about nine and a half years old. Um, I am really big into a lot of technology. I actually have taught around the Waukesha and Elmbrook school districts. Um, working with some of the students teaching different technologies and working with some of the teachers on how to implement different um, lesson plans and things like that. Um, and so I, um, ever since I was really young, have been really interested in helping people and wanting to make a difference in other people's lives and be able to help people where they need help as far as learning stuff, different technology and things of that nature. So Jenna, what was it like when you uh, found out about your condition? Um, shocking. <laughs> it was very hard because I was born legally blind and I started losing my sight when I was in middle school and by the time after high school I had light perception and then just recently lost that in 2018 due to cataracts and glaucoma. Oh wow. So what are some misconceptions um, that people in the community might have about blind and, and, blind, and blind and and visual impairment? You mind if I go first? Sure, go ahead, Zach. Um, so um, a lot of people think that blind people can't do much of anything. They think that they're pretty much more or less hermits. They just sit inside and don't do much at all. They rock, they poke their eyes and stuff of that nature, which isn't true. Um, I actually have gone and done all kinds of different things. I've gone to space camp. I've gone to um, USLAM, which is a um, STEM program. And I've also done the Colorado Center for the Blind, which is a program to teach um, independent skills to adults. And in that, we also got to do different activities. So we got to go skiing, we got to go whitewater rafting, we got to um, drive a car, we got to go rock climbing, do a bunch of things that way. So there's really not much a blind person can't do it's just a matter of people giving us the opportunities to do it and just letting us debunk these myths that are surrounding blindness because they're just not true. 
So Jenna, what are some of your techniques that you use to get around? I use a guide dog. Her name is Isabella. We also call her Izzy or Bella. Oh. Do you use anything else? I use a cane as well. I don't use it very often, but I do carry it around with me when I go to summer school for the school for the blind and stuff. What about you, Zach? Um, right now, I just use a cane. Um, <clears throat> I've been a cane user ever since I was three years old. And I'm not entirely sure yet, but I think later on down the road, I might look into getting a guide dog of my own. What are some misconceptions people have about a blind person? Um, lots of times they think because I am blind that they should talk louder, you know, yeah. so I can hear them better. And I'm like, I'm not deaf. <laughs> I hear you. <laughs> they, they get those mixed up. Um, and then there's the really nice people. I mean, yes, they're very nice and they want to help, but they over help. Like, do you need an arm? Do you want a guide? And I'm like, no, the dog can help. The dog can see where she's going. I'll have her follow you. Um, I think right now, um, because of how I was born, like what my, my condition is and my eye condition, people want to get those like mixed up. Like they want to say that my blindness is because of this and, or the blindness is not caused by this. And then people just want to mix things up because they, they have no clue. Yeah, no clue what you have to go through. Yeah. Yeah. So I have a, another question. Um, is public education on the subject of blind and vis visual impairment important in today's world? I say definitely. Yes, more, yes, more so now, um, especially given that with the advancements in technology and things of that nature, um, bringing l to light what a blind person can do and showing others that we're more than capable of living independent our lives is so important and there's a lot of work to be done Okay, um, I have one, one last question for you guys. Um, what are some ways to interact and non-interact with people who are blind or visually impaired? Um, to interact, um, well, for starters, um, someone should come up to me and address me who they are because I can't see them. Um, they should just say, hi, Jenna, this is so-and-so from wherever. So I know who you are. And please do not leave the room and leave me stranded talking to the wall. Exactly. Or uh, the floor or <laughs> wherever I'm looking. Because right. I might still think you're there, but you left. And that's kind of embarrassing. Yeah, to just leave you stuck <laughs> like that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> The don'ts, I would say, don't treat me differently because of my eye issues or, you know, anything else about my disabilities. Just address me as a normal human being. Exactly. I mean, I want to be treated like everyone else. I don't want to be labeled with this person who's blind or the person with LCA or, you know, Exactly. You want to be labeled as Jenna. Yeah, I want to be labeled as Jenna. Jenna and Zach. Mm -hmm. So that's all the time we have for this interview, you guys. But I would like to thank you both for sharing your stories and experiences. They were unique and they were very interesting to hear. Um, I honestly got a better understanding um, of what's seen and unseen. So that's sadly this is all the time we have for today. I would once again like to thank Dr. Randall Melchert for joining us today and also Jenna and Zach.
for joining us as well. Once again, I'm your host, Jennifer Monk, and thank you for joining us on this show. I hope this has been a unique experience and being able to truly be seen in the dark. <laughs>